Well, now, except for Jesus, every one of those kings that ever has lived or that ever will live is going to die. Amen? Amen. But there's only one that has risen and is alive, and he's alive forevermore. Revelation says, I am he who was, who is, and is to come. Let's give him praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Turn around. If you, if you believe that, turn around and say amen. amen. God bless you. In Jesus' name. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. Have you ever been someplace where you walked in on something and everybody's excited? You like walked in late or you were out somewhere and something happened and all of a sudden everybody's screaming and hollering, whistling, clapping their hands. They're crying with joy. They're jumping up and down, just acting all uh, excited, acting all excited. And you walk in, you kind of feel like you're out of it. You kind of wish you knew what they were excited about, like you missed it and you kind of want to be involved with it. Ever, anybody ever have anything like that happen? Two of you, the rest of you live in boring lives. A boring life. How many of you ever really seriously have ever had that happen? Sure you have. You, whether it's that you're, you walk in late for dinner and somebody's already excited and they're, they're have, they've announced they're going to have a baby or they're just getting married. You just miss, miss the, uh, pr the proposal uh, or somebody just won a million dollars or somebody just received something, you know, good. And uh, you know what I'm saying. I've been, even when we see things happen in court, think about this. And all of a sudden you walk in, you're in a court line, you maybe see the court filled like this and you don't know what's going on. Maybe you walk in a court and all of a sudden you see the courtroom erupt and people jump up and they're clapping and hugging one another and they're just so excited. You go, I wonder what happened. Everybody say, somebody just got off. Somebody was found innocent. Amen. Their guilt had been removed or proven wrong and so they have been liberated. Everybody say, liberated. Amen. I will show you, show you this little uh, video or this little wavy thing that somebody sent me this week. Uh, that I think Lynn gave it to me, to you. I want you to see this. If you get all excited, you might act a little bit like this. We, matter of fact, we need to probably act a little bit more like this. Look at, keep, let, let it go. It'll just keep going. I just, how many of you think she might be excited? Oh, she just, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I think I might have just wet myself. I am excited. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, it's almost like at the end she's going to praise Jesus. Watch her mouth. Go ahead. Let it go one more time. It looks like, can you see it? Uh, now, I'm probably, that's probably not what she's saying, but it looks like she's going, praise Jesus. Amen. Praise That's what Palm Sunday is all about. Palm Sunday is all about that. And you don't want to miss that. You definitely don't want to miss that, except in other words, the coming of the Lord. And they, they missed it. The scriptures tell us that they, in Luke chapter 19, they missed, I think it was Luke chapter 19. We, we'll get down in here later. But uh, the, 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 the Jewish people. Christ came to save the Jews, said the Jew first, and then, 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 then the, uh, the Gentile. And he came, and, and for actually in the mercy of God, it says they missed their hour of visitation. Their king, the king of kings came to them, the Davidic king. No Jew uh, of good character would ever receive a king as the king that was prophesied in the Old Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, that was going to come and liberate them unless that person came from Davidic or from, the da from David's lineage. Because David was a... Of course, he has to come through the tribe of Joe, uh, Judah and so forth and so on. There's a lot of Old Testament things. And they would never accept a king that did not come from David's uh, lineage. But they were all expecting the king to come. Yeah. They were all expecting the king to come. When Jesus came at this time, they actually, if you do a lot of studying, if you do some studying, you'll find it historically that they were expecting the Messiah to come. Did you know that the Jews today really believe that the Messiah, they believe he is coming. Some of them believe he's coming this year, 2018. This is the 70th, 70th year, the anniversary of Israel becoming a nation. The Bible says, you know, 70 years are appointed to man, and so forth and so on. Or, or, and then, you know, and, and and so forth and so on. And so they're excited. They're expecting Jesus to come. I'm expecting that Jesus to come. The world is expecting Jesus to come a second time. And again, he's already came once. He's going to come again. Uh, and I was just reading this morning in the Old Testament, Zechariah, and it talks about the, the Lord bringing back the kingdom of God. And, and he's going to cause Jerusalem to flourish again. And a lot of that's happening now. We, Lynn and I, every Sunday morning at about 530, I guess it is, when it, uh, it's maybe 5 o'clock when it comes on. I'm not sure there's Israel news when it comes on Sunday, as far as we know. And it's always showing the numbers of Jewish people that are
are coming to Jerusalem from all around the world. And, the, and God said in that, in that day, when I'm getting ready to come again, this is, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to call cause my people to come from all four corners of the world. And they're going to come back to Jerusalem. Now, there's a scripture that talks about the Jerusalem that's from above. And that if we are born again, the scripture says if we believe upon Jesus, if we have faith towards God, we actually become Abraham's seed. Because Abraham was one who believed God. You remember he made a vow to God that he would, he, you know, that he was going to tithe and belong and, and give 10% to God, uh, trusting in God to bless the other 90%. And if God, if you'll bless me, then I'll, I will tithe and give and so on and so on. That's where that, that whole principle came from. Which was way before the law even. But the point is, is Abraham, it says, went out looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Amen. He was looking for something that man cannot make, even though they try to make it. They may make a lot of, if you've been to Dubai, or not, I haven't been to Dubai, but if you watch it on, on the news, Dubai is like this multi-millionaire, trillionaire city. It's like the most modern city. It's like unbelievable monies go into that place. And they've created this island. It was just an island. And they've, they've, they've built it up somehow and now they've made this special place it's like the elite of the elite of the elite go there and it's an amazing place but that's a city that man built but Abraham went out looking for a building uh, or excuse me a city whose builder was God the builder and maker was God God has to build this city and that city is the city that's made four square it tells about in Revelation it's four square which uh, to me is a kind of a symbolic thing it reaches the north south east and the west it's from all corners of the world uh, ethnicity of the world, out of all the races, God brings one race. It's called the it's called the human race, but in the body in the kingdom of God, it's called the body of Christ. We we are all now Christ. Since there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither black or white or Hispanic or Asian. As far as God is concerned, it, we are all His kids. We are all one family through faith. It's through faith and it's through the blood of Christ. We need two things. We need the faith. Amen. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you can't be a true Jew who God is coming after if you don't believe in God and believe that He is coming back after you if you don't believe He's coming for you to take away your sins and you don't really have faith towards God that there is a God. The Bible says that, that those that uh, please God must have faith and they have to believe that God exists, number one. And number two, number two, they have to believe that He's a rewarder. Somebody say that with me. A rewarder. of those, a, a rewarder. How many, you, how many of you believe that God is good and His mercy endures forever? See, uh, I now, there's a lot of reasons why we as people don't believe that. Well, he took my daughter, he took my son. He didn't take him. I mean, he didn't take him. Uh, you know, if somebody got shot, robbed, robbing someplace, God didn't take him. Amen. He may receive them. If they're a believer, he receives them to himself. But the Apostle Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So he receives us there. But God didn't come down and say, okay, you're going to die of cancer and you're going to die of a, you're going to die of this disease and I'm going to throw you in front of a car and I'm going to let you get murdered and I'm going to let you be in the tower. He didn't, he didn't desire you for that. The, death is the design of the devil. Life is the design of God. Bad things come from the devil and from wrong choices, but good things come from God and choosing to serve Him. Amen? And so we want to know this, this. We get excited about some things. So what are we getting excited about? We've sang about it all morning long. <coughs> Excuse me. And some people, uh, uh, some people back then, they were expecting him to come. But yet, when he came, the Bible tells us that he came and he was among his own. His own didn't receive him. Oh, wow. His own didn't receive him as king. But he says, but as many as those that do receive him, he will give them the power. The word power there is authority. He gives them the authority, the right, the legal right to become the children of God. In other words, he adopts us into a family that we were never a part of. Amen. We, uh, the Bible talks about the first Adam and the second Adam. First Adam being Adam who fell into sin and took the whole human race into sin. Every one of us, regardless of our color, regardless of our height, regardless of our weight, regardless of our DNA, it all goes back to two human beings, Adam and Eve. Every race came from there. Amen. Every, every Women and men came from there. Amen. So just get over yourself. 
And get along with everybody else. Get over yourself. Get along with everybody else. Get over yourself. Get along with everybody else. Hey Amen. We could dance to that. Hey, wouldn't we dance if that happened? Wouldn't we rejoice if that happened? See, there's a lot more coming to the world when Jesus came, what He came to bring, than we realize. He brings us into one family. He brings us into one inheritance. We all inherit. God is the creator and the owner of everything in the universe. And the Bible tells us that we are going to inherit all that God has had as our Father. That's why you don't want to be on the wrong side in the second Adam. The first Adam was born in sin. It says we're born in sin, shaped in iniquity in Romans chapter 3. All of us. It's the way you were born. Michelle, you could be a princess. She, and, and Sister Debbie or Brother Jim, and, and even though your wife tells you you're just, there's nothing like you besides sliced, sliced bread, there's nothing to compare. But the truth is, we've all sinned. We have all sinned. Matter of fact, we can point our fingers at each other and say, well, you sinned. And you point right back at me and say, so have you. We have all sinned. In other words, sin means we stepped outside the boundaries of God's counsel. We've either obeyed things that we shouldn't have obeyed and disobeyed things that we shouldn't have disobeyed. Or you see what I'm saying? Or disobeyed things that we should have obeyed and obeyed things that we should have disobeyed. We've done things, said things, thought things, felt things. Uh, 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 we have uh, <coughs> blamed God for things He never did. We've given a false testimony to God Amen. about God. So all those things are sin. Just not believing in God is sin. Why does God hate sin? Because it takes you to hell. If Adam had never sinned, we would still be walking around on planet Earth. We would be walking in the Garden of Eden. So he was cast out of the Garden. It was a special place there. It's over in Iraq. No wonder we're fighting over there right around Babylon. Just about 30 miles outside is the original, uh, original city of Babylon. And right there in that area in the Middle East is where they have pinpointed that these rivers, the Euphrates and so forth and so on, that was the paradise. That was paradise. Now, isn't it strange that now we're still focused on the, at the end of what was focused on in the beginning? And yet we look at that stuff and people still don't believe. You can't make this stuff up. You can't make it up. It's impossible. <laughs> Amen. So anyway, he came to his own. His own received him not. And so we need to receive something that's really excited about. So, you know, uh, I want us to ask you, ask a question. Okay, you, you've actually, you've act, how, would you, how many of you would like to get excited about things you need to be excited about? Yeah. How many of you have ever been excited about things you don't need to be excited about? Yeah. Oh my God, I think they're going to lose my job. I think, oh my God, I think I'm losing my house. Oh my God, I think I got games. <laughs> we, we worry about 90% of the, they say 90% of the things that we worry about never happen in the first place. So we spend most of our lives worrying about things that are never going to happen. Turn around and tell somebody, I don't think that's we're smart. <laughs> you say, well, it's human. Well, we need to get out of humanity and get into divinity. Yeah, we are born again after the Spirit. And Scripture tells us in Philippians that we're to be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Words, don't get all worried about stuff. Amen. But take all of your requests. That's important because God is our Father. He says, bring all your requests unto God. With in prayer, talking to God about it, and supplication, which is just turning to the Word and reading and praying of the Word of God back to God. You said, Lord, and just Lord, we want you to remember and Randy, who's in the in the VA hospital right now, or Bruce Rudo, who's who fell and broke his back, or Sister Drea, who just had her foot cut off in Champagne. That's the body of Christ, yeah. and uh, probably many other things that we don't even know about. Uh, you know, we 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 see those things. He said, Don't be anxious about those. What's going to happen if this happens? Or that happens or this happens. He says, you know, don't get, don't sweat the small stuff. He said, but God is not small to me. He said, I'm not talking about from your perspective. Amen. It's small stuff to God. If God said there's no stars in the heaven, there's no sun, there's no moon, the, the earth is covered with water so nothing can grow on it. It's just a big blob of water hanging in the, hanging in the universe, which just says in Genesis 1 it was. And God can say, I'm going to straighten this mess out. And he begins to hover over the, over the earth and begins to make things new again. Yeah. He begins to make things that they ought to be. Mountains where they need to be. Lakes and rivers and streams where they need to be. And he says, well, it's too dark out here. So he flings a sun out there and a moon out there and all the stars in the universe and so on and so on. If he can do all that and he didn't have to sweat it, why should you be sweating things that are just n nothing to him? <laughs> the worst that can happen to you means nothing to God for what he can do. Oh, my God. 
Paul said, if, if you take me out of here tomorrow, I'm going to be present with the Lord. And not for 70 or 80 years, but forever. If you're not preparing for heaven, it's like saying you're going to work till you're 110 you don't need any help. You're smart enough to prepare for retirement, but we're not part smart enough to pre prepare for retirement. Amen. We go. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The angels. Oh, I feel the strength of God coming on me. Let me pull something down. Is there any pillars? No. I love God's timing. That's great. Actually, it was that an idea coming to me. You just heard it too? It's amazing. I hear it. Oh, yes, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, until somebody comes and explains to you why everybody's getting excited, oh, I'm talking about getting excited in a good way. Oh, yes. Now, if you're looking at the grave and you don't have any way out of the grave, you might get excited in a negative way. But Jesus done away with fear by conquering the grave, by conquering death, hell, the grave, and all the devil and all his demons. He arose. He arose. And you need to realize that if he won the victory and gave the victory to you and I, we got something to get excited about. Amen. I want you to be able to get excited too today. I want you to turn with me first of all to a couple scriptures. I want you to go with me to, uh, what did I do with my scriptures? Here, Matthew. Or, uh, yeah, we're going to go to Zechariah. And I want you to go to Zechariah chapter 9. And there's a lot of places that we could find that talk about the coming of the Lord. I mean, this is the amazing thing. There are, there are hundreds of things that Jesus fulfilled that were said hundreds of years some of them over a thousand years before he came. Amen. And said, this is what's going to happen. This is how he's going to come. This is how you're going to know him when he comes. This is how to identify him. And those things happened hundreds and hundreds of years before, and thousands sometimes, over a thousand years before they actually happened. It's 2,000 years from Adam to Moses, 2,000 years from Moses to Christ. So when, it, when, it, when we hear Moses talking about what things are going to happen, and he's writing down all these things, and in Genesis we hear about these things, we're talking about things that God said in the beginning, in the, at the Adam, he says, there's going to be one come Satan, he's going to bruise your head. Amen. He's talking about the seed of God, God's seed or God's uh, lineage. Okay, go, uh, what did I say? Go to Zechariah chapter 9, didn't I? I didn't turn, all, I didn't turn there. Zechariah chapter, chapter 9. And I want us to, to look at That's right back close to Malachi. It's almost at the end of the Bible there. I'm going to get to it. I should have already had it marked. There we go, Zechariah. Okay, let's go to Zechariah. And let's go to uh, Zechariah chapter, uh, what did I say? Nine. nine. Yeah, here, i got two sets of notes up here, actually. Page one, page two. Zechariah nine. Zechariah nine. And then we're going to go over to Matthew's uh, gospel. Zechariah, I love this little child. Did she come up? Did you see her come up? And she looked over at the mercy seat. We got a, we got a picture of the mercy seat. Jesus is that covering, grace and mercy. And she came up and went, stretched to her. I, I wonder sometimes little children don't see things that we don't see. There could be an angel sitting there, as far as we know. Amen. She don't bother me unless she takes my candy. Then we're going to have trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Zechariah chapter 9-9. Nine, nine. And I was, uh, we're going to start maybe, yeah, in chapter 9. It says, uh, this is, it actually is a subtitle here, The Coming King. The Coming King. This is before He came. Zechariah is way before Jesus came. But he's saying, before He came. Okay, so he says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. So uh, there's some instructions here. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. This happens in Matthew. It happens again in uh, Luke. So we know that these things happened. And it's a fulfillment. Those things happened in the New Testament are fulfillment of the things that said he was coming in the Old Testament. He says, I will cut off the chair from Ephraim, so on, so I don't want to get into that. But let's just go back to this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, behold, pay attention. Behold, like Jesus when he came walking out of the mountains, John the Baptist says, Behold! In other words, look, here he is. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was introducing the Lamb of God, the sacrifice of God that he was making. God the Father was making, God was making the sacrifice for his own house. Yeah, yeah. Glory. <laughs> 
the blood is put over the doorpost of the house in Exodus to protect everybody in the house. If Jesus had not come, there'd be no blood from heaven. If there was no blood in heaven that was accepted as a sacrifice, you and I could not be in this house and actually, and actually declare we are the children of God. We believe in God. We, we could be proven that we're not because they'd do a blood test on us. How many know, they, they say, we can tell who you are and what you are just by taking your blood. And the blood of Christ brings us into a new dimension. It brings us into a new uh, position. It brings us into a new family. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, I don't want to get into this, but John 3 talks about it. We'll talk about it some other time. But anyway. See, we got to know why we're, why are we getting excited? What are we getting excited about? Because that's when he says, rejoice greatly. He says, rejoice greatly. So I want you to really be happy. I want you to really be happy. Get all excited. Go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. And then he says, and then he says, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Well, when you look up daughter of Jerusalem and daughter of Zion, they're actually used as interchanging. They actually mean the children of God, the children of Israel. And for us, we who have been baptized, we who have been born again, are born again into the in this, into God's family. And it's talking about the church. She's called the bride of Christ. It's called the bride of Christ. So it says, rejoice. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. So he's, everybody say, he's trying to give us a, a, a reason to be excited. You see, if I give you something, if I gave you a rock, if I just gave you a rock, and I go, here you go, and you go, well, and I say to you, well, how come you're not excited? I mean, well, it's a rock. Well, say, yeah, you don't know what kind of rock it is, though. If you knock off the outside of that, you'll find out it's a pure diamond inside, and it's 25 carats. How many of you think you might get excited? It's a pure diamond. It's, it's, it's almost without value. It's, you can't put a value on it because it's so, it's so extreme. It's so wonderful, so beautiful. So we have to know what we're getting. We have to know what we've been given, but you can't get excited about it. If I come up and give you a key, you go, huh, that's, what's it to? And I find out what's to a new Maserati out here, to a, a key to a to down there on in Miami in some great place on the beach or whatever and it's worth six million dollars you might get excited if you knew that see people say well I'm just not an excitable person <laughs> you just haven't got the right thing because I guarantee you if you get the right thing you will find out how untrue your statement is that you're not excitable yeah. we're all excitable yeah. in a good way yeah. we're all happy let one of those Reader Digest people show up with that check. It's about as long as six of those chairs, and it has a whole bunch of zeros on it. And we'll find you getting excited. <laughs> Your neighbors will say, that's an excitable person. I've never seen her that way before. I've never seen him that way before. That's because he never understood or she never understood what had came her way. Amen. And we don't think about this. See, we don't think about what's coming yes. because the, the enemy's got us caught up and our humanity's got us caught up in what's happening oh, true. instead of what's coming. True. And if you're not looking for what's coming and expecting what's coming more than rejoicing over what's going on here, even if it's good, he said, unless you love me more than mother, brother, sister, father, houses, lands, you can't be my disciple. Why? Because you don't realize that I'm asking you to get excited about something that's eternal when all this stuff here is going to pass away. All this stuff's passed away. So God's asking us to get excited, and he, and he wants us to get excited. He here is telling us this. I want you to go to Matthew also. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 21. And uh, we're going to read the story here. And I'm a, yeah, I got to really quick. Go quick, 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 quick. Psalms 21, or Matthew 21, excuse me. <clears throat> Matthew 21, 1 through 10. It says, now when they drew near Jerusalem, and they, this is on the, actually, the, he's coming, uh, you know, right before uh, the, the Passover. So now when, the, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. How many of you can see the, the correlation between what I just read to you and Zechariah? He will come to you. Your king is going to come to you, bringing salvation and bringing judgment. Amen. He's going to judge the devil. Amen. He's going to judge the world. What's that mean? I find the world guilty. 
What are you going to do about it? I'm going to die for their sins so they're innocent. I can see it being paid for. And it's innocent. Okay, so where is that? Matthew 21, or yeah, Matthew 21, 1 through 10. So you see the correlation. Come to it on a, on a donkey. So then in Matthew chapter 21 again, at verse 2. Saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled. That it might be fulfilled. Everybody this was done so that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet tell the daughter of Zion behold your king has come to you I just read it to you lowly it means humbly not coming in arrogance not coming as a dictator not coming as one that demands that you fall at his knee or he'll slay you on the spot not going to put you in prison but he comes lowly he doesn't come as I've been here to, I've come to be served we know better than that Jesus when he washed his disciples feet he said I am among you as one who serves yet I'm greater than you are yes. Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly. How is he coming? He's coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey. A colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, if you, those of you, you may have been, had heard this before, but when a, when, a, when a king came in, back in those days, they came in as conquering kings. And when a conquering king came in, they usually came riding on a white stallion. If you book, look at the book of Revelations, you'll find Jesus coming on a white horse. He's coming back as a conquering king in a way you don't want to see him come back. Because he comes back with a sword in his hand and flaming, flames coming from his mouth and from his eyes and so forth and so on. He's coming down to put his enemies under his feet. Now he's talking about enemies on, yes, uh, spiritual enemies. Because how many of you know the devil has been defeated? Okay, but he's still around. He's still around, okay? You still have to mess with him, but as far as the devil being hold on you and hold you in the, in, in, in the bowels of death, he can't do that any longer. He's lost the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He's lost those. Yeah. But he's still here trying to do the same thing, sneaky snake, that he did in the at Garden of Adam. He's trying to keep people away from the truth so that they'll perish. Yeah. If you're here today, God's got you here right. as the tree of knowledge, or excuse me, the tree of life, so that you won't perish. If you don't know the Lord, you're not here by accident. God brought you here because he saw you before you were created in your mother's womb and he really has a plan for you to be with him in heaven throughout and around the table with all of his children inheriting everything that he's making for us now. Jesus said in John 14 I'm going away to prepare a place for you that where I am you might be also. If it weren't so I would have told you so. If I go away I will come back and receive you to myself that you might be where I am. That's what this king came to do. And for us to shun his invitation, to shun his, come on in, leave your shame, your guilt outside because it's already been paid for. That's old business. You know in every business meeting you got old business and you got new business? God's going to tell you, get there, this board meeting is about new business, not about old business. You get saved again, God said, this is about new business, not about old business. We're not, we're not going to go back and talk about old business. I took your sins, sins and I cast them into the sea. I cast them as far away from me as east is from the west. As a matter of fact, I'm never going to go fishing for them again, so you need to forget them as well. Oh, remember that I died for you and rejoice over what has been done. Remember his death till he comes, that it took death out of the way. He overcame death and it wasn't permanent for him. Remember this about me, that I came and served you out of love. I laid down my life for you willingly so that you could say, you no, know, he went to your debtor and said, I've already paid for that. And he bought you back. That's the good news of Jesus. He said, well, I'm not, just right. I'm not right before you. You're never going to get right. Jesus came to make you right. The only way you can get right is believing in his ability to make you right. The righteousness of God is what you need. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. Nothing I do will make me spotless before the Lord, blameless before the Lord, sinless before the Lord. Amen. Guiltless before the Lord. Nothing I can do. No matter how good it is. I stand before a holy God and he says, I'm sorry. Holy means without sin. Without spot. Without blemish. It means without failure. It means without fault. Can any of you stand before me? Let you who is without sin cast the first stone. 
You can't do it. Hallelujah. But we get all excited because he said, I want you to forget the old business. The new business is let's be about the Father's business. I got things to do. I got places to go. That's called resurrection life. Read it in the Message Bible. It says, this new life, this resurrection life is, is I've got places to go. I've got things to do. Let's get all excited and go tell everybody what Jesus Christ has done. Amen. That's what we, you've been brought out of old business to be brought you into the Father's business, which is redeeming the world to himself. Amen. We're messengers. Amen. We go to spread the good news. Now, so uh, uh, we look at this 20, uh, 21 again, Matthew 21. He says, uh, he says, if anyone says anything to you, the Lord has need of them immediately. He will send them. Go on down to verse 5. He says, tell him that your king is coming to you. He is coming to you. This is what it talks about when it says, and I'm not going to go there. I've got too many scriptures. I don't want to take them all there. But this is what it means when it, when it says they missed their hour of visitation. They missed their time of visitation. There was, there was a time for them to receive Jesus as their king. It doesn't mean they don't get to get a time again. As I started to say this, the Bible says that God has shut them up in unbelief. Which means they can't, they can't believe. As a nation. There are still Jews being saved. There are still Muslims being saved. There are sinners like you and me being saved. And Hindus and Buddhists and, and uh, witch doctors and everybody else being saved. But He opens our eyes so we can see. He opens our ears so we can hear. And, and, we, and then He touches our hearts so we can believe and receive and we step in because of grace. God's grace is God's power working on you to influence you to do what He wants you to do. He's never going to force you to do it, but the goodness of God leads men to repentance. He has come here. The goodness of God just moves all over you. And if you reject Christ, you've done it out of all willfulness and stiff-neckedness and stubbornness, hard-heartedness because God has done everything to bring you to Himself. When the devil comes to accuse you and throws you before Jesus' feet and says, you know what he did. You know what she said. You know what they said. You know what they thought. You know what they did. Blah, 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 blah. You, you can stand up and say, that's right, Lord. What do you say about it? He said, it's already been forgiven. If they, if they receive me as king, I've already paid for what they did. So they can go, they can come, amen, where I earned the right to be. See, Christ earned the right for you. You and I cannot earn the right. He earned the right. And then it says, as many as received them, to them gave he the right to become the sons of God. You've got a right to become the sons of God. Why? Because God brought you out of sin, paid for your sin, to make you a son of righteousness. A daughter, a child of righteousness. Out of God's righteousness, his rightness, he made you to be eternal. And he can save you and keep you and deliver you. And we need to remember. Remember the, you need to think about it. So I've heard this a hundred times. Well, you don't act like you've heard it because there's not many smiles on our faces as we walk down the street. People don't even know you're a Christian because you're so unexcited about it. You haven't told anybody in ten years. Don't tell me you're excited about it. How many of you right now, now I want you to be honest with me because I don't want God to strike anybody dead. We don't have a, a cemetery out here yet. <laughs> and I don't want you to be the first. Okay, here's the deal. What if you seriously... Won ten million dollars. Somebody, let, you found out today that somebody left you ten million dollars, and all you had to do is receive it. How many of you would likely go tell a whole bunch of people that you know? Three of you telling the truth; the rest of you still need to be born again. Praise God, Lord. There's a bunch of liars among us. Save us now in Jesus' name. Come now quickly, Lord Jesus. I don't know why we don't hold our hands up on that stuff. We're embarrassed to hold up hands in the church. Say yes, that's me, and we. And, and how do you expect to ever do it in the world? Amen. If you're too intimidated to hold up your hands here and say, I'll be a part, this is no big deal. Hold your hand up. You, yeah, everybody would hold their hands. I would go tell somebody. Now, somebody said, I wouldn't tell nobody. Not even your kids? Not even your mom, your dad, your grandma, your best friend? Yeah, you would. Come on. Come on. You know better than that. They'd be called you sister blabbermouth and brother blabbermouth. And, and my God, it'd, hit, it'd be on the news before you even got home. If you told the wrong people. Right? Get all excited. God is saying to us, church, people of God, people that want to be people of God, get all excited. I've worked this thing out, man. I've worked this thing out. I've got this great big ark here, and even though the rain is coming, you and I can be saved if you choose to get on the ark. Amen. But if you don't get on the ark, it's your fault. 
The door's been open for 120 years. Did you know that Noah, it took him 120 years to build the ark? And he was telling people for 120 years that God had said to him, the judgment's coming. That's what happened. After about 10 years, they go, oh, bull, come on, man. This, oh, this old coot, he's lost his mind. And another 20 years, then 50 years, then 60 years, 75 years, people go, oh, oh yeah, yeah, my great grandma used to tell me that he said, he said, he's just an old coot. He's out there in the woods. He's kind of like one of those people, you know, just, who? How are you doing? How? Oh, look, some mouse food to eat. Huh? He's just crazy. <laughs> That's what they'd be saying. He's a nutcase. He's been building that thing nine years old. He's going to fall off that thing and die before ever he gets it built. He's a hundred and some years old. And the dude's up there 60 feet above there and trying to knock in nails. Elephant, would you feel me something? There aren't any elephants around at that time. There's nothing in the boat. There's nothing there but faith. When nothing's in your hand but faith, believe me, you're going to get the job done. If God told you to do it, it's going to come your way when it's time to come your way. When did the elephants show up? When did the leopards show up? When did the animals show up? When it was time to get in the ark. God's getting ready to bring a bunch of clean things in in the last days. We're going to see a revival. You're going to see people coming to God who are listening to God. And those that are not listening to God are hardening their hearts. And all of a sudden they go, I don't hear nothing. What are you talking about? You don't sense that? You don't feel that? You don't hear that? No. You know. We don't want to become spiritually tone deaf. Mm. Praise the Lord. See, God wants people to say, Easter is not about us coming to church and having a great time. It is, but be excited out of knowledge. What are you all excited about? Well, I don't know. Everybody else is clapping. <laughs> He said, raise your hand. I raised mine. What would you raise your hand for? He just asked you if you want to give him a new car. Raise your hand. You didn't hear that? Oh, my God. No. I'm trying to be facetious in some way, but I'm trying to bring a serious point to us that, listen, we need to pay attention. We need to stay focused. The Bible says in Matthew 24, when you see these things begin to happen, Jerusalem's coming back, all the countries around the world are ganging up on Israel. It's happening. It's happening. He says, you need to know when you see all these things begin to happen. Perilous times are going to come. Children are going to uh, uh, be disrespecters of parents. Somebody said that happened a long time ago. <laughs> Amen. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. We can afford to give a basketball player $40 million to play basketball. But people in the church even want to keep their pastor in a Volkswagen 1979. <laughs> I, I don't have a 79 Volkswagen. I have a nice 83, and it's one. No, so I'm teasing you. And, and it's not my car, by the way. The church owns the car. I don't own the car. The church owns the car. I haven't owned the car since I don't know how long. Probably 15, 20 years. Just drive whatever they give me. Whatever the Lord gives me. Now, Lynn has a car. As soon as we get the horses strapped to it, pull it up here. <laughs> No, I'm teasing. You, you, you see what I'm saying? You say, are you trying to get us excited, Pastor? You better bet your booties I am. God is trying to get us excited. Why? Because when you're excited about something, you talk about something that you're excited about. And the good news was given to the mail carriers. And if the mail carriers aren't excited about the mail they've got, nobody's going to hear the message and nobody's going to be saved. Thank you. I appreciate that. You and I will start a new church next week somewhere. I don't know where. No. I want the whole. See, the Holy Spirit, He's not trying to condemn us, but He is trying to convince us. He's trying to convince us that we've got something and we, uh, we need to just realize. You, you realize you can come before the God of the universe that split the world wide open? Oh, my. At one time swallowed 20,000 people up in an earthquake because they did something wrong. That that same God you could approach that Moses said he went to a mountain and the mountain was covered with, it, it was all kinds of dark clouds. There was lightning and there was thundering and fire in the mountain. Did you know that they found that mountain actually? Did you know that, Jeff? Yeah. Found that mountain? Yeah. I believe if I'm not right, somebody else knows this. Saudi Arabia? Is in Saudi Arabia? And the whole top of that mountain is charred. Yeah. Wow. 
black. And there's all kinds of little footy prints. And, and this is what the Jews would do when they were on the wilderness. Everywhere they set their feet. Because God told Abraham, wherever you set your feet, I, I, I'm going to give you that land. And everywhere that the Jews went when they crossed the Red Street and they went all up into the wilderness and passed away, they come around this mountain of Saudi Arabia. They just found this out. They were looking for it in Israel. And it wasn't in Israel. It's actually right there in Saudi Arabia. They have a big fence all the way around it. It's, it's a, no trespass. You can't get there. They don't want the Jews to realize that they were there. But they can't get rid of it because as they, uh, you can find this on the internet. You can find it. They show you the video footage of it, the videos of it, the, the, the people that, 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 that uh, explored it and, and discovered it. And there's all these rocks around it. everywhere. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of these rocks all the way through this path and all the way around this where a huge amount of people, a million and a half or two, that's what came out of Egypt. And they're all around this mountain where they camped out and these little rocks got footprints on them where the people chiseled in footprints as a, as a reminder that we were here. The people in the Bible say, hey, you ain't got any proof that stuff happened in the Bible. Oh yeah, there's proof out there. You're just not looking for it. It's out there. The archaeologists are proving it every day. I mean, the scientists are proving it every day. It's exactly like the Bible said. But why hasn't that come across the news? It says because they do not like to entertain God in their own minds. Why? Because if I entertain God, I've got to change my life. It puts me on the wrong side of the fence. All right, let me get back to my message here. Okay, and so in Matthew 21, did we go all the way through 10? I think we did, didn't we? Yeah. No, 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 no. Let's go on up here a little bit. Well, let's go to verse 9. We just jumped that. Okay, he, he said, Tell the daughter of Zion, your king's coming, lowly sitting on a, on a donkey, coal, fi, uh, the foal of a donkey, in the, which they did. And then it says in verse 9, Then the multitudes, mul everybody say multitudes. multitudes. Multitudes went out before, and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, Who is this? What are we all excited about? See, some people realized this was the King of David. They believed, the people that were shouting Hosanna, 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 they believed that this was their coming Messiah. They believed he was the king. But they thought he was going to come and destroy the Romans and, 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 and take over as the most powerful nation on earth and set their capital up in Jerusalem and, and bring the Philistines, uh, the Philistines under slavery or just say you're under my domain now. And, and they thought he was going to come and bring a literal uh, touchy feely uh, gold, silver, jobs everywhere kind of a, kind of, you know a lot of people come to God that way thinking that if I just come to Jesus, they don't come to Jesus to get saved. They come to Jesus because they want to prosper. And there's nothing wrong with it. We are going to prosper. But the truth is, if you're a lover of filth or lucre, or if you're a lover of gold, then you, you are, we are in the same place as the word in, in Moses' day where they were making golden calves and they were saying, these are your gods. Wall Street's not our God. Hey Amen. There's nothing wrong with having riches, by the way. It's always about doing with what God has given you something that glorifies His name while you're here, you need to have some footy prints around somewhere when you leave saying they were here and here's the good works that they did. Here's what happened. God blessed them and they blessed us. And Oh, what great blessings. Yeah. See, that's what Jesus was talking about. He came to love us and He tells us to love others like, we, like He loved us. Uh, in Luke chapter 19, verse four, uh, 40, it tells us uh, that they're, they're, they were crying. They said, I'm going to go to Luke chapter, what is it? Luke chapter uh, 19, verse 40. Uh, we're going to jump down there real quick. This is where he, Jesus, where Luke is telling the same account. And like Luke 19, 40, or 19, verse 40, they have asked him up ahead. In verse 38, they're saying, and the reason why I went there is look at it the way it's written here in the New King James Version. It says, blessed is the king. This is what they were shouting and they were singing uh, with a loud voice. Verse 37, loud voice voice for all the mighty works they had seen. They were blessing him and worship for all the mighty works he had seen. What was he doing? He was healing the sick. He was raising the dead. He was casting out demons. He was feeding the multitudes. He was, he was forgiving people of their sins. He raised a man from the dead. Raised several people from the dead. What's that about? It's about him saying, I've got the power of life and death in my hands. Yes. I came to bring you life in that more abundantly, John 10, 10. I want you to realize I've got the power to do that. And then he raised himself up. 
from the dead. Unbelievable. But it says, blessed is the king who comes, if you'll see this, in the name of the Lord. That goes back to an Old Testament scripture, or excuse me, a New Testament scripture where Jesus is in, in uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 39. He says, you'll never, to the Jews, they're getting ready to crucify. He says, you're never going to see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And in Isaiah 53, you'll find out that they said, we esteemed him smitten of God. Then in other words, they weren't saying he was blessed of God. They were saying he's cursed of God. And that's why he's hanging on the cross. But he became a curse for you and I. Yes. Yes. Amen. But even though his flesh was dying in the, in, in, in the weakness of his flesh, he gives up the Holy Actually, in the power of the Holy Spirit, he says he gave up the ghost. Nobody took it from him. He gave it up. He willingly died. He just went, he just gave life back to God. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And he, and he was done. And the centurion looked up and went, oh my God, who has power over life and death? This guy just died on according to his own will. They're supposed to be up there for days. Uh -huh. He just literally gave, he wasn't even afraid. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. His blood is dripping from his mouth and every portion of his body and he's screaming out the holes in his side. Uh, not from the sword, but from the whips. They, you know, they had steel balls and bone and brass tied into the leather strips. And when they'd throw that on, it would hook him like a fish hook. And then they would rip it out and it would literally rip strips and chunks of skin, bone, muscle out. And they would be exposed, exposed nerves, exposed lungs, exposed entrails. We don't know. It says his visage in the Old Testament, his visage, his appearance was so marred, so messed up. That not even his old mother could have recognized him. That's the reason why he shows up on the road to Damascus. Everybody stands there and gets the last picture of Jesus. And they go, oh my gosh. He says he shows up on the road to Damascus in another form. He was well. How do you know? Because he said, he said to Thomas, "Show your, here's the holes in my hand and the holes in my side. Everything else was cleaned up. They didn't look at him and say, oh my God, he can't look at you, Jesus. He says, I just want you to remember what I did for you. Don't remember what they did to me. I'm not coming with all these Scars to remember. I just want to remember that Amen. I was hung there for you. Yes. Who? Lord? King. The King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. Let's go to, uh, is, is Matthew 11, 19, 40, says, he, he says to there, he says, they said, can't you keep these people quiet? And he says, look, I'm telling you that if, 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 I, if these people hold their peace, immediately, he says the word immediately, they don't hesitate, they don't wait, they know who I am. Because I created those rocks. I made them. They weren't even here before I said, let there be rocks. Do you understand that? Yes. So turn around and tell somebody I think I'm smarter than a box of rocks. Just tell somebody. <laughs> it's kind of like he's saying to them, are you smarter than a box of rocks? I guess not because you, I was among you, didn't recognize me. But the, the, the rocks who don't even have a spirit, who don't even have a brain, Man. who have no intelligence, would immediately cry out in their place, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. What's that word Hosanna mean? Well, it means, it means send prosperity now. Send prosperity now. It says, oh Lord, and save. It's an Old Testament scripture. I don't want to go to all of that. But the point is, what they were saying is, when he came, they were, when they were crying Hosanna, it wasn't just some word. Uh, they, they were saying, they were saying, they were saying, save now, oh Lord. Save right now. God wants to save you right now. If you don't know Jesus, he wants to save you right now from, from, from the death sentence that's on you because of sin. He wants to, he wants to save you right now out of that sinking uh, sea of sin and set you on a solid rock to stand so he can safely take you, not just safely take you home, he wants to make you, he wants to make you a witness to the world of his power to transform lives. Amen. He wants to put you on a right track. He wants to get you in a right mind so he can prosper you and bless you and, and, and give you peace that passes all understanding, that, that causes joy unspeakable and full of glory, that just causes you to walk around, that, that even when they're getting ready to throw you in the lake, into the fire, you can say, uh, the God's able to save me from this, but even if he doesn't, I'm going I'm, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna praise the Lord. I'm not going to worship you. See, the devil wants to wear you out. He says, God, you let me get at him. And that's the reason like the junk in the world's going on, they'll eventually give up their faith. If there was a God, this stuff wouldn't be going on. You say, no, if there wasn't a devil, there wouldn't be this stuff going on. The devil bought this stuff in, and there's people yielding to the devil. 
-hmm. resisting the will of God and the word of God and the work of God and the power of God that are yielding themselves to this carnal flesh that's yield that is born in sin, shaped in iniquity. You're simply doing what your flesh wants to do because it's not smart enough to do what God wants you to do. So God gives you a new heart. He gives you a new mind. He puts in a new spirit in you and says, I can save you, but you've got to come to the cross to see that happen. You've got to humble yourself and say, I was a sinner. I come guilty of what he hung on the cross for. And I come saying, thank you, Lord. The goodness of God leads men to repentance. I, I turn away from my sin. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I turn towards you who saves. And I'm believing that you, Lord God, will give me the power, the ability, and the grace to say, you've already touched my heart. I, I see what you did for me. And I'm hungry for what you've done for me. And I'm thirsty for what you want to give me. This world has wore me out. And maybe you're just wore out because you've made so much money there's no more fun in it. I met a man like that one time. He said, there's no more fun in it. You make a million dollars, what is it if you make another million? Make one successful business, three successful business, 50 su at over 50, then over 100. He said, once you've done it once, there's no more, there's no more thrill in it. It just gets old. I'm going to tell you what, Jesus never gets old. The joy of the Lord is unspeakable and full of glory. He comes to satisfy your soul. There's something on the outside that can be, say, uh, can be satisfied with a little pleasure of sin for a season. But the thing that's going to satisfy you in here and make you what you want to be, what He calls you to be, what He's destined you to be, that's only going to come by coming to the foot of the cross and accepting that dripping blood of Jesus to drip on you. And God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. I'm trusting in His death, His burial, His resurrection. I'm trusting in His goodness. I'm trusting in His Word to wash me and cleanse me. I'm trusting in him who's a good king who came riding on a donkey. Oh my. The donkey was a was a, a peaceful little animal. And he comes riding on a donkey. He doesn't come in all boastful like, I'm here. He comes in as a suffering Savior on the back of a burden-bearing. No wonder the Scripture says burden one, bear one another's what? Burdens. You see, those colts that He needs us to carry Jesus to the world is you and me. Look at somebody and say, Yeehaw. 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 You don't see the donkey going, Yeehaw! Yeehaw! It's not a rodeo. People get saved and fight Jesus riding on their life. He said, I want you to take me in. I want you to come in and I want you to lay down your life and show love to the world so the people that are out there say unsaved will see God is good and His mercy endures forever and, and they'll sense my love, the love that you have one to another, bearing one another's burdens, praying for one another, holding one another up, encouraging one another, provoking one another, love and good works, restoring those that have fallen into sin and bringing them back into the new relationship with God. That's what I want you doing. And you can do that right where you're at. You don't need a platform. You don't need a CD or a DVD. You don't need a great ministry. You are the ministry. Amen. You are the we, you and I are the servants of God. Whether we're boxing groceries at Aldi's or whether we're running nations, CEOs, it makes no difference to God. He's filled us earthen vessels, earthen vessels just made out of clay with the power of the Holy Spirit, the oil of God, the oil of Gilead that brings healing to people. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Anoint them with oil and pray the prayer of faith. And she, he says, the elders pray the prayer of faith over and they're going to be healed. Why? Because you're carrying me to them. Amen. Is anybody getting this? Yeah. It's more than coming to church on Sunday. It's more than opening up in a hymn book. It's more than memorizing scripture or quoting scripture. Yeah. It's being the living word. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought there was a baby in there. I've either woke her up or raptured her, one or the other. I don't know which one. I was got loud there and I thought, oh my gosh, she got a baby in here. Hallelujah. I sense the presence of God in this place. Why? God says, I want you to know how much I love you. 
I want to know what I want you to know what I came to do for you. And you realize that I did come to save you. I'm the answer to that prayer. Clear back in the Old Testament. That's in Psalms where they cry out that he's going to come and they're singing Hosanna. And actually what it says there, it says he will come and they're going to be singing save now, Lord. This is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Well, maybe next Sunday. How do you know you got next Sunday? Well, how do you know he's still going to be standing at the door knocking next Sunday? He's been knocking for years. You don't know when your heart becomes so hard and callous that you can't hear it anymore. He's farther and farther and farther away. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? He's not moving away from you. You're moving away from Him. And all He says is just open up the door and let me come in. And I'll sit down with you as a friend. I didn't come to, I didn't come to you know, beat you with a rod. I didn't come to steal everything away from you. The devil's been doing that. That's the reason I'm here. I heard you came on bad times. You've been letting the devil mess with your life. I came to bring you back into the prosperity that God has planned for you. And that word prosperity doesn't just mean wealth. He's talking about spiritual wealth, prosperity. He says, will you be made every whit whole? Amen. You want your bodies healed? You want your minds healed? Yes. You want your families healed? Yes, yes. You want to have peace? Yes. You want to have joy? Yes. How many of you know you can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have peace, you don't have joy, you don't have a family, you don't have relationships? Uh, that's not a happy life. You probably become a, one of the grouchiest people on the face of the earth. Oh, my. Come on, and health? Oh, yes. He heals our bodies by His stripes, Isaiah 53, by His stripes we're healed. And we're healed, first of all, spirit relationally. When we're brought back into right relationship with God, a lot of these things that come on us as a result of sin, we can trust in Jesus that by His stripes I was healed. And did you know there's 39 stripes that He received? you know that? Did you know there's 39 major diseases that all sicknesses and all diseases and all infirmities fall under? 39 categories. Each one of His stripes was received to take, you say, I paid for that. I paid for that. It says He bore our sin. What was the stripes for? It was for sins, but He bore them for our sins because sin is what brought sickness and disease, violence, jealousy, envy, covetousness. It's what brought it into the world in the first place. And He said, I received each one of these stripes willingly, not without pain. I was suffering, but I suffered for you because I love you and I didn't want you to have to suffer for things that only I can pay for to get you out of. This is what we're turning down when we say no to Jesus. Yeah. Amen. So what do I have to do? Well, if you hear the doorbell ringing, you just answer the door. That's all you need to know. He said, I'm going to come in and do, I will come in and sup with you. I didn't ask you to do anything other than open the door. You open the door, I'm going to come in and do for you what you cannot do for yourself. You see, I know how to do it. If you knew how to do it, you wouldn't be in the situation you're in right now at, waiting for me to knock on the door. He's going, I've been wanting to fix this for a long time. <laughs> come on. Stand with me. Praise the Lord. Stand with me. Listen, well, sickness, disease. I got a bunch of other things that I, I don't want, feel like going into. I just, I just want to tell you. It was Psalms 118, verse 25, where it says, Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray now and send prosperity. Let me just read a scripture while you're here. And I'm going to have you sit down because I'm going to give you a song to sit down on. Let me uh, go to, matter of fact, go ahead and sit down. I forgot I was going to do this. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Turn around and say, hey, I'm glad to see you're awake. <laughs> Col Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And I'm going to read some verses here. Now, please, please pay attention to what I'm saying. And, and Sister uh, Tammy, if you will put this up on the screen. I'm going to start in Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 5. And I'm going to read some things because this is helping us understand some things. Okay? In 2 verse 5. Did I say Colossians 2 5? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, no, 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 no. Verse, verse 6. Verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, have you received him? My question is, have you received him? When you say, what are you getting all excited about? So I'm getting excited about somebody that came as my king, came as my suffering savior, he came as my liberator, he came as my healer, he came as my provider. He came as my eternal father. He came to give me eternal life. He came as a life-giving spirit. And he gives his spirit to me so that it will be life-giving. And even though I may be in the grave, my spirit goes to heaven. And one day my body is going to be made new. 
Like before Adam, how do you know Adam is going to be made? God's the one to decide that. He makes us a new body and we're going to be caught up together with him in the air. She says, you therefore have received Jesus the Lord as your Savior, as God's own Son, as your Deliverer, as the one that can, the only one that can pay the price to deliver you from sin, pay the debts, and bring you into heaven. Amen. So walk in Him. As you therefore have received Jesus. What's that talking about? Oh, let me tell you what it means. By faith. That's right. You received Him how? By faith. You believed. Mm -hmm. So walk in Him. How? By faith. <coughs> Trusting in the work of God. Trusting in the Holy Spirit. That He that began a good work in you is, going to be, is able to complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians 3.20 Unto Him is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which we ask or think according to His, his what? His good pleasure. His good pleasure. Yes. How? Yes. Through the power that worketh within you. This is why you need to be born again. You need the power of God to become His witness. You need the power of God to be transformed. You need the power of God. Not, oh yeah, I'll receive the Holy Ghost one day. I'll receive the power of the blood. That's wonderful. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Yes. Are you now walking by following the leading of the Holy Spirit? Or if you say, well, I got done. No, you did. the devil wants to trick you and say, you got everything done you need to do once you accepted Jesus. That's not true. You've got to walk with Him daily. And it's a wonderful thing because I get a I get a fellowship with him like Adam did every day. Amen. Meeting with him in my private meeting with him. His Holy Spirit coming on and listening to him and fellowship with him. He's giving me counsel, giving me grace, telling me what to do, telling me what he's done for me and helping me to go out and do the things that he only he can do through me. Rooted and built up in him, not the law, building and rooted up in Christ. In grace. And established in the faith. Be established in the faith. That through faith, by grace we are